Welcome, folks, to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Every week, diving deep into the truth of Catholic social teaching and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. I'm Dr. Bud Marr. And we are coming to you live through the miracle of technology across all these United States. I am here in Des Moines, Iowa, where you just maybe heard that we have an upper level disturbance bud but they mean weather you know i when they say that sort of stuff i always think maybe like someone's flying an old biplane with like a, a mean message on it but they actually mean the jet stream uh but coming from you live des moines iowa <laughs> here at mercy one uh studios uh for iowa catholic radio um i'm here where i am the director of mission and ministry at mercy college of health science and the director of mission uh, of the zeta institute for foundation and ethics and leadership you can find us at mchs.edu and zetainstitute.com but out in pittsburgh what are you up to what kind of disturbances do you have and what part of the atmosphere yeah, I'm here at the uh, National Institute for Newman Studies, and you can find all about what we're doing at newmanstudies.org. But, uh, but do you remember back in the day where I used to come? I tried to come up with a uh, like a unique intro for each show. Yes. Like one day I just said I'm the doc. Yeah. Have you ran out was, or something? Was that obnoxious or endearing? No, that was not a, a, a lower level disturbance or anything. We we all loved that. My um, in our household, our second born Claire, she's like the big nicknamer. Okay, so she comes up with like great names for everybody. Dominic is weirdly Bubba Zoo. Okay, and Cyprian is CJ Buddy. But it's kind of funny because uh, the other girls try to like match her nicknaming skills, and they just can't pull it off. So you have uh, like one child that you're like, I don't, I don't know what you're going to do in life. Maybe, maybe you're not going to excel at anything. But if a nicknames are needed, you are an invaluable resource that no one else can match. Yeah, Malin tried to call CJ like Peanut or Nutcracker or something, but it, it's CJ Buddy. So I need to ask Claire if she can give me a, a new a new radio name. moniker. Yeah, I, my, our the person in in my world uh, that was the the supreme name giver nickname giver was named Dennis Kunal, but I really can't say what nicknames you sure. get everybody on air. <laughs> We're not uh, taped delayed or anything. That's yet. right. We're not taped delayed, so we can't bring up Dennis Kunal stories. Uh, but what we can tell you is that we are brought to you, uh, underwritten, as always, by Cartridge World, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, Iowa. Um, we got done with uh, March Madness, so our usual gambit at this point of year, pointing out that you can uh, print stuff out, has gone by the wayside, but... At this point, uh, baseball, which uh, you can spill endless ink and reams of paper talking about baseball. We, we already have people making predictions for the end of the year, even though it's only been like a month. Uh, but that's what happens when you're in the midst of lots of Cubs fans, and they got to look to math to have any sort of hope at all, bud. Baseball is the ultimate statistics sport. And, you know, when I was little, we used to play this great board game, and you, like, it was all about crunching stats. So you need a, you need a reliable printer. That's what right. What else can you say? You we know? could also print out all the times that uh, Yellick is hitting home runs on the Cardinals it's if we're going to make fun of our team. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then underwritten by Mercy College of Health Sciences, it's been a momentous month, and it just keeps rolling on, bud. We had all of the inauguration <coughs> celebration ceremonies last week. I want to thank everybody who came out and joined those. We have uh, stressless – We are, that's a tradition. We have stressless days because uh, we're uh. trying to help people – uh, calm down before they have finals next week and then after finals of course we have graduation and so sunrise sunset everything keeps moving forward but since that means one semester is ending and others beginning and if you want to check out all the programs that mercy has mchs.edu no so i saw some photos from the uh, inauguration it looked pretty awesome what's crazy is uh the the people who work to set up the inauguration particularly yep. the ceremony over in uh, Veterans Memorial, uh, the lighting and everything, it, it seemed like they had a room reserved just for us. Um, and then, of course, we had um, the uh, inauguration mass at St. Ambrose, and it was beautiful. Bishop gave uh, Bishop Apes gave one of the best homilies I'd heard in a long time, uh, and it was nice that it was about us. And we had a wonderful Faith and Healing speaker series, so, um, and, and that actually is going to be online at some point as well. So we want to thank the community for coming out, and then we want them to keep us in mind uh, when you or your children or people you know or friends 
Uh, when it comes up about what you want to do with your future, your future is in good hands with us, mchs.edu. Well, speaking of uh, the past and the future, bud, um, a lot of things, of course, happening uh, that make us yeah. think about that. Of course, it's Holy Week. Um, we had the Notre Dame fire that basically the entire world got to see in live time, either on screen or through social media. Uh, the fact that it stood after it looked like it was gone. Um, all of this brings up, you know, ultimate questions, it seems. Yep. In, in the news, it, it, we can't help but think about uh, what are we actually here for? What does it all mean? Like I said, all the big questions. And I think that rolls today into the guest we're going to have and what he's going to talk about. Yes, our guest today is Steve Himmler, and he's the president of the Catholic Apologetics Institute of North America, not simply the United States, all of North America. Watch out, uh, Canadians. (laughs) He's written a book called Search No More, The Keys to Truth and Happiness. And, of course, our show is about the common good, and those two pillars are foundational, um, truth and happiness. But like you said, Bo, I think a lot of this is on people's minds. You know, you see uh, a cathedral burning that took almost two centuries to build and has lasted, you know, several centuries now. And it it raises all sorts of questions about humanity's place here in the world. Um, What should we dedicate our time and our energy towards? So I think this will be a good conversation with Steve. Yeah, we're looking forward to it. And I I don't know, I I was on earlier today with John Leonetti, and so we were bringing up beauty and stuff like that. But I'm suspecting that a lot of people uh, have been surprised about how much they'd be interested in a building over in France yeah, um, but that it starts to ask these deeper meanings that come up again and again. This is the perpetual question that mankind's ask: What will make me happy, and what will have any sort of permanence at all? So we're going to explore that, um, talking with Steve about his book and uh, the topic in general. So this is the uncommon good. Stick around, and we'll be back after these messages. <laughs> But if people want to join in on the conversation, it's easy to do so. Just use the Zip Whip line. 515-223-1150. 515-223-1150. That's the Zip Whip line. You can uh, text in hashtag UCG for the uncommon good and leave us a question. Of course, we would love to be able to answer questions when it's off air, too. And if you do that with the hashtag, we'll be able to answer them later. However, I think that there's plenty to talk about, not only with the, the issue at hand with our guest, um, but also with Notre Dame Cathedral, Holy Week, everything coming up. So please feel free to be a part of the show, either today, now, live, or if you want us to answer a question later on. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back after these messages. Thank you, Blessment International, for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Everyone lives their life 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year. How we use that time directly affects if our life will leave a significant impact or not. Each year, Blessment International leads Central Iowans on a 12-day, all-inclusive experience sharing the heart of Christ with children in South Africa. Teams are forming to do something significant in an African child's life. Learn more at BlessmentInternational.org. That's BlessmentInternational.org. Hey friends, John Leonetti here. Big thanks to R&R Realty Group for underwriting my show and for their support of Iowa Catholic Radio. R&R Realty Group Sierra Point Apartments are located in West Des Moines. Think granite tops, oversized windows, 24-hour health center, and heated underground parking. R&R Realty Group is locally owned by a Catholic family. A great blessing to Iowa Catholic Radio. rrrealty.com. That's rrrealty.com. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400, and online at cartridgeworld.com. Vitae Family Care is part of the Iowa Catholic Radio family. Pro-life physician Greg McKernan, a DO, has practiced for 27 years, seeing patients of all ages with just about every kind of need. Dr. McKernan lives his faith as a physician and is trained in NAPRO technology, allowing him to diagnose and treat many female conditions and even markedly reduce the occurrence of a miscarriage. VitaeFamilyCare.com Remember, Vitae is Latin for life. Back with the 
the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr, wonderful to be talking to you this Wednesday morning. Bud, if you wouldn't mind, could you introduce our guest today on the show? Sure. Our guest this morning is Steve Himmler. Uh, he's president of the Catholic Apologetics Institute of North America. Uh, you can learn about their organization at canaweb.org, C-A-I-N-A-Web.org. Steve's also the author of The Reality of God, The Layman's Guide to Scientific Evidence for the Creator, and his most recently published work is Search No More, The Keys to Truth and Happiness. Steve, thanks for being on with us this morning. Good morning, uh, Bo and Dr. Bud. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, I wanted to jump right into discussing the book. So, uh, Steve, you point out at the, the very start of the book that happiness is a question that concerns us all. You know, it's so uh, just uh, central to human existence. And yet, in our day and age, uh, you know, a lot of people confuse uh, happiness with, with pleasure-seeking or with uh, just you know, acquiring certain material goods. In what ways do you think uh, Christianity challenges the way that maybe contemporary society thinks about uh, happiness and what constitutes the good life? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it's uh, best summed up by St. Augustine's famous quote from uh, 1,600 years ago that many saints and people have realized since that time, that our hearts are restless until they find their rest in God. We keep looking for happiness and love in all the wrong places, and it's basically in living a, a God-centered life that we find the happiness uh, that we're looking for. And so many people can testify to that, and that's discussed in the first part of the book, how being a committed Christian can bring us true happiness. Um, I want to, uh, this is Bo, thank you for coming on the show, and thanks for including all of North America. Bud and I are joking around, you know, it's not just the United <laughs> States, and we know some wily Can Canadians, so thank you for <laughs> doing your, your part. Now, um, so in the news today, uh, uh, the, this whole week, uh, you know, Holy Week, it's hard not to talk about uh, the events that happened on Monday with uh, Notre Dame Cathedral in flames, and the whole world who seems to ignore questions about uh, religion or deep questions about happiness, all of a sudden um, obsessed with this over 800-year-old um, building. Do you think that sometimes that's what it takes for people to to shake out of their malaise uh, of thinking like all there is is just sort of like putting one foot in front of the other to ask these questions? And so in a weird way, is it maybe the case that we don't get around to talking about happiness until we lose something and it's in that absence that we begin to ask, what is it that we've lost? Do you see that happen um, in your talks or in your engagement with people? Absolutely. And this gets to another topic that's going to be the focus of my next book, uh, suffering, and how pain and suffering is oftentimes the means by which we finally come to turn to God and find that true happiness that we're looking for. And C.S. Lewis, interestingly enough, called pain and suffering God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world, because it's oftentimes through these difficulties in life that we, uh, you know, do turn to God and realize that when when God is all we've got, God is all when God, we find out that God is all we need when God is all we've got. When we reach the bottom of the barrel and and turn to look up, then we can find what we've been looking for the whole time. And this uh, Notre Dame fire is very sad, uh, but it's quite remarkable that the uh, stone vault ceiling protected the inside, most of the inside of the cathedral. So I think there's going to be a strong commitment to rebuilding this uh, you know, wonderful structure back again, and in that we're going to see a greater commitment to not just the cultural heritage, but the Christian heritage of Europe. They're going to be asking themselves, you know, why do I want to do this? And, you know, it's to preserve our heritage, including our Christian heritage. And so that may have a way of bringing people uh, more, you know, back to the church and to faith. And we saw instances of people uh, singing Ave Maria and praying outside the cathedral. And, and again, I doubt they would have done that had, had that fire uh, not happened, that tragic fire. So, Steve, this is kind of related, but you have a whole chapter in the book about why turn to God, and I know that a large part of your time and your energy is spent, you know, doing apologetics work. It's a really complex question, but why do you think many people today um, opt for skepticism over faith? Like, what are what are some of the factors 
that have created, frankly, a more secular world where I think the default position, like the philosopher Charles Taylor says, is more one of like you'll have to you have to show this to me rather than starting from faith and, and going from there. Yeah, I think we do find that to be the case today, and I think uh, in large part it's because of this perceived conflict between science and faith that many people uh, today see and believe that somehow science has disproven God and that scientific truth is the only type of truth that's worth you know studying or learning about. And nothing could be farther from the truth, and that's what my first book gets at, The Reality of God, The Layman's God, the scientific evidence for the creator, it goes through the rest of the story about how science actually uh, provides compelling evidence of God's existence, uh, contrary to this myth that they're in conflict, uh, science and faith are in conflict. And it's, um, it, it's interesting to note that God will not prove himself to us. Um, it, the evidence discussed in my first book and in my presentations the scientific evidence, the implications of the Big Bang, from nothing comes nothing, so if we got something, then there must be a cause for that. The laws of nature, E equals MC squared, F equals MA, all these uh, mathematically elegant uh, laws of nature that take the greatest efforts of the finest human minds to unlock must have come from a mind, capital M, uh, far greater. How could they have come from anything else? And then the th- the fine tuning of the universe. This fairly recent scientific discovery that there's about 20 of these uh, numbers, these constants in the laws of nature: speed of light, gravity, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. They're all set to precisely what is needed for us to be here. If any one of them was just a little bit different, we wouldn't be here. So this is uh, compelling evidence of the existence of God, but it's not proof. And I think. Um, Norman Geisler, in his book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, he gets to this, and I, why God doesn't just uh, prove himself to us. He, he basically offers us an invitation uh, that isn't overshadowed by coercion, uh, such as what occur with an overpowering revelation of himself that would leave us cowering in submission, and that's not what he wants. He's given us the freedom to choose free will to believe in his existence or not. And he quotes Norman Geisler, Dr. Geisler has this to say, and he says that God has provided each of us with the opportunity to make an eternal choice to either accept him or reject him. And in order to ensure that our choice is totally free, he puts us in an environment that is filled with evidence of his existence, such as discussed in this book, but without his direct presence, a presence so powerful that it could overwhelm our freedom and thus negate our ability to reject him. Why should we have the ability to reject God? And he goes on, he says, in other words, God has provided enough evidence in life to convince anyone willing to believe, yet he's also left some ambiguity so as not to compel the unwilling. In this way, God gives us the opportunity to either love him or reject him without violating our freedom. For love, by definition, must be freely given. It cannot be coerced. Even God can't force us to love him. It wouldn't be true love. It cannot be forced. So we have a choice, and many people are looking for proof of God's existence today. They want that scientific certainty, and and they're just not going to find that because that would take away our free will, and and, uh, that would not result in the true love that God wants us. He wants us to know, love, and serve him. I think that the interesting part about that, too, is you hear people say, like, oh, science it proves all these things when actually what science seems to do actually a lot better is just serve mystery after mystery that makes us think about these things so if you think about the news cycle that seems a hundred years ago even though it was just late last week um the big science news of course was the first imaging of a black hole i mean i know that uh people think about that and get it wrong as if like we took a polaroid picture and that's what black holes look like no it's like maps and 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 different types of uh readings uh you know overlap and stuff to get this sort of idea but nonetheless um i even took my kids down to the local planetarium and they were already talking rightly so about the amazing aspect that like this is the first time we've imaged in any way a black hole and what f- struck me is if anybody thought showing that up on the planetarium wall was like proof about like solving all of these deep questions i have uh, it just seems to, I mean, A, really misread what's being presented, and then B, uh, to sort of poke the fun out of science itself. I mean, this deep, wonderful mystery about what's going on, and 
you know, I, I just think sometimes people, uh, to your point, want to use science as a cloak to not actually think hard about things. So we go, oh, science explains it. When even that, it doesn't even short uh, change the faith. It short changes science and what these discoveries mm. are showing us about the mystery of creation. You know, we're not getting the full truth. The rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say, uh, <laughs> what's taught in schools and and uh, mostly on TV never really takes it the next step, which is to reveal uh, how it reveals God's presence and His glory and, and the beauty of it all. Uh, that's also discussed in my first book, uh, that we desire this beauty, and, and we find that in God's creation. Uh, you know, if we just have the eyes of faith to, to see that, and that it's God behind all that beauty. And both of these books, The Reality of God, The Layman's Guide to Scientific Evidence for the Creator, and my new book, Search No More, The Keys to Truth and Happiness, are oftentimes bought and being given as gifts to children, grandchildren, and others, who, you know, don't practice the faith. Almost uh, over a quarter of the people in the country today, adults in the country, don't have uh, practice any faith, and that's the largest single denomination now. And so the first book is given to people who want to uh, have questions or doubts about the existence of God and to help them answer those questions and, and come to belief in God. And then the second book builds on that, Search No More, in that it looks at... Uh, big questions about happiness, Jesus, salvation, and why do we need the church and the church. And so that that book, Search No More, The Keys to Truth and Happiness, is for those who believe in God but do not attend church. And that's a very large part of the number of people who do, are unaffiliated with any church today. They may consider themselves spiritual but yeah. not religious. In other words, they believe but they do not belong. But like you said earlier, they're looking for more in life. They're unhappy, and they don't know why. And so that those happiness chapters at the beginning are what I call a happiness hook that basically uh, draw people into the truth of the church and, and the keys the, to the happiness and truth that Jesus gave to St. Peter uh, when he established the church on the rock of Peter. He gave him the keys to eternal life and to truth and to real happiness. Steve, one interesting part of this new book, Search No More, um, is the whole discussion you have on near-death experiences. Right. And this is an area where, I don't know if you'd say science, but you would say like um, uh, human experience, sort of like our, our subjective experience of the world, overlaps in interesting ways with questions about spirituality and the transcendent. And I, I gathered from the book that you think this uh, pretty broad phenomenon of near-death experiences gives us reason to... Um, I don't know if I'd say believe, but to trust all the more some of the things that our faith teaches us. Absolutely. And uh, what's interesting, uh, many times people dismiss, dismiss near-death experiences as a like a, a chemical reaction in the brain or mm -hmm. something like that. But uh, they have done quite a few scholarly studies of thousands of near-death experiences, medical studies, and they provide some compelling evidence of the validity of near-death experiences um, one thing is that they these people report confirmed what's called veridical observations of the physical world when they're unconscious or during death, and they they come back and they talk about things that they saw and heard when they were dead. Their their heart had stopped and they were flatlined, and yeah. so how can that be? And these things were confirmed. They were really happened. And one, a classic example is what's called Maria Shoe. Um, this lady, Maria, was taken after cardiac arrest to a hospital in Seattle, and uh, she was later revived and talked about having these observations when she was unconscious and dead. And uh, one of the things that she said was that on the far side of this hospital, on the third floor window outside on the ledge, is a tennis shoe with the shoelace tucked under the heel. And the people in the emergency room there in the hospital were stunned, and, and they said, well, you know, how could this be? How could she know this? Because she'd never been to this hospital before, and she was unconscious the whole time. And then she, uh, they went and they looked and they saw that shoe exactly as she said. And so, how would she have known that? You know, her body, her uh, consciousness, her soul, basically left her body when she was dead, and and saw that. And uh, these kind of things confirm over and over again that this is not just a chemical reaction in the brain, that it that there's 
something actually that lives on after our body dies, and that's our consciousness and what we call our soul. And some other things that confirm the validity of these near-death experiences, and I think that will help people see the reality of heaven in an afterlife, is that blind people, people born blind since birth, report seeing things during a near-death experiences, uh, colors and and they were, and how could they have seen this, you know, when they're, when they're, uh, for the first time, when they're dead? And, uh, again, these things were verified. And as, we, as in the movie Heaven is for Real, uh, people report meeting previously unknown deceased relatives during a near death experience. People that the, were they related to, uh, that they didn't know that they had this relation, and later they come back, like in that movie and say, uh, you know, that there's, they met this person who, who they never even knew were related to them when they were dead. And a new thing that's being studied by Dr. Raymond Moody and others is called shared death experiences or empathic death experiences. And this, this also indicates the validity of these near-death experiences because uh, what that is, involves is that somebody in a hospital room with a person who is dead or dying has a similar experience, this tunnel and the light and the life review, and, and they're going through this near-death experience empathically with the person who is, is dead or dying. And um, and then later that person is revived, and they both report the same experience. So how could that have happened? You know, How could a person who is fully alive and conscious and doesn't have this chemical reaction in the brain, how can, how can that uh, be explained? you know, by that chemical reaction. Well, and if, another, if, these, if these sorts of phenomena are, are, like, opening up people to questions of faith, what, I mean, how would you, how would you sort of encourage someone along the way? Like, where should, where should someone begin if they say, like, I, you know, I have reason to, to think there, there might be a God out there, and I want, want to learn more? Well, uh, of course, I would read the book, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. Search No More, The Keys to Truth and Happiness. And uh, at the end, it talks about, you know, if, if you find this evidence of God's existence and of Jesus' divinity and resurrection and yeah. how we're saved, you know, so many people uh, aren't really considering that question, but the, the near-death experiences, like I say, reveal the reality of heaven, our soul, and an afterlife, and so, you know, it is something we should take seriously. So how are we saved? Um, and, you know, getting into that question uh, in the book mm -hmm. as well. And then go to church. Why, why should I bother going to church? So the last part of the book uh, looks at the church. Uh, why does the church still matter today, especially with this clerical sex abuse and cover-up scandals, which are tragic and have gravely damaged the, credit, the witness and the credibility of the church? But uh, we look at why the church still matters and why go to Mass. And then the final chapter is what's next. And it gives specific suggestions on... Uh, what people can do to take that next step, uh, how to get involved in a parish, or uh, if they're Catholic, uh, go to confession, things like that. Well, Steve, I want to uh, tell you thank you for uh, joining us and pointing this out. You, you pointed out, of course, your new book, uh, the um, uh, sorry, uh, Search, Search No, no More, More, The Keys yep. to Truth and Happiness. I was looking at the, the old title, forgive me, and then uh, <laughs> the, the one that you had before, The Reality of God. And I also see here that you have a, uh, the... Catholic Apologetic Institute of North America. Uh, what's their website if people are inter uh, interested in that as well? Yeah, the website for Cana, where I give these presentations, uh, multimedia, PowerPoint, video-based apologetics presentations, parishes, schools, started on eighth graders in Catholic schools. That's very, very well received. God and science, where does the evidence lead? Evolution, creation, these sort of topics, um, as well as Jesus, uh, divinity, salvation, suffering. It's canaweb.org, C-A-I-N-A-W-E-B.org, like Cain and Abel, not the wedding feast, C-A-I-N-A, web. And the books are available uh, uh, on Amazon from the publisher, Tan Books, from local Catholic bookstores. And uh, every, and many people, like uh, practicing Catholics, buy these books to strengthen their faith and to be equipped to know what to say to people who challenge them or question them about why they believe in God or why they go to church and, and how do we know Jesus really rose from the dead, these these kind of questions that oftentimes come up. So it, mm. it helps equip devout Catholics for uh, you know questions that they can better answer 
uh, for people who have doubts or questions about Catholicism. So, Steve, yeah, Stephen Himmler, president of Catholic Apologetics Institute of uh, North America, like you said, www.canaweb.org, and the books we discussed today. This is The Young Common Good. We'll be back after this break. <laughs> But if people want to keep up with what we're doing here on Iowa Catholic Radio, it's easy to do so. All you got to do is go to Facebook.com and type in iowacatholicradio.com, and you can follow us there. Easy enough to also see all the tweets that we are tweetering about. Uh, IA Catholic Radio is the handle for Twitter. Um, and then as we've been joking around slash seriously, I think we're on other stuff as well. I think at this point on Instagram, um, they're taking pictures of... Uh, like stuffed animals, right? So like the, an old mongoose at a taxidermist, and there's like this really nice plate of uh, fruit. Um, if you see that and can confirm that at all, just let us know. Uh, but then, of course, you can always go to iowacatholicradio.com and uh, join up for the, the twice-a-month email that lets you know everything we're doing. This is The Uncommon Good. We'll be back after this. Vitae Family Care is part of the Iowa Catholic Radio family. Pro-life physician Greg McKernan, a DO, has practiced for 27 years seeing patients of all ages with just about every kind of need. Dr. McKernan lives his faith as a physician and is trained in NAPRO technology, allowing him to diagnose and treat many female conditions and even markedly reduce the occurrence of a miscarriage. VitaeFamilyCare.com Remember, Vitae is Latin for life. Why give to the Catholic Tuition Organization? To help families who want to send their kids to our Catholic schools and just can't afford it. Some donors like to give part or all of their required minimum distribution from their retirement account. The 65% Iowa tax credit you receive are a tax benefit you just don't want to pass up. Ask your tax advisor or contact us online, ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for underwriting Crisis the Answer with Father Ricardo, heard Monday through Friday at 11 a.m. Confluence Brewing Company is a local brewery in Des Moines featuring seasonal and limited release beers. They have cans and growlers to go, apparel and other gifts for family and friends. Live music is featured in the tap room. Confluence Brewing Company Company is located off the bike trail south of Grays Lake. Thank you to Confluence Brewing Company for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio on the web at confluencebrewing.com. That's confluencebrewing.com. Back with the Uncommon Good, Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Glad to be with you on this Wednesday of Holy Week. Uh, the holiest week of the year, uh, where all of our Lenten practices have culminated into preparing us to truly celebrate the great Paschal mysteries of our Lord Jesus Christ. Starting tomorrow with Maundy Thursday, uh, the bracing ceremony of Good Friday, our patient waiting on Holy Saturday, and then the joyous celebration at Easter Sunday that we've all been waiting for. Bud, um, you ready for Easter to come around? Are you ready for Lent to commence? Um, yeah, well, I feel like I have to really brace for the triduum. I love it, but like uh, our children are at a stage in life where it is kind of a marathon liturgical experience. So a lot of my time is spent like roping in the two-year-old boy. Ah. I can't. I can't say like I enter into some sort of mystical ecstasy during the Holy Week. Maybe if days. like if he wears you out enough, uh, you can like sort of lose consciousness and have a, uh, a a vision like Paul did. That's what he's aiming for. You just don't. You don't embrace it enough, bud. Sorry to call you out on air. <laughs> right. Well, Dominic surprised me the other day, kind of uh, slugged me when I wasn't looking. I don't know. I think he was just like, oh, this is wrestle time. <laughs> and so I did. I, I at least had those little birds flying above my head like you see on the cartoons. Wow, that's pretty amazing. That's a, that's a pretty good uh, right hand that he has. Um, so speaking of you know getting a right hand to to the jaw um, and, and, and yeah. being sort of uh, birds floating above us, not believing what's happening, uh, you know, there's people, and they have a point, 
who said that we shouldn't read too much into Notre Dame Cathedral being on fire Monday yeah. of Holy Week, right? That buildings catch on fire, that maybe we're trying to overread the situation. I have to admit that I just got done teaching a semester about medieval literature, and the medievals never felt like you could underread a situation. Yeah, uh, part of the allegorical imagination to use big old literary words is that um, there's it, you know what I'm going to back and put it this way: someone like the Ro- yeah Rolling Stone magazine, but of all people, were accusing Notre Dame Cathedral of being overburdened with meaning. I love that phrase. And right, and this is what yeah. everybody was like, this is a perfect way to talk about the Catholic view on life, which is yeah. um, everything, humans, wind, water, this building, this century, yeah. this event, that God is so effusive with his love and knowledge that everything is overburdened with meaning, and that that's what's gorgeous about it. So on one hand, I take what people are saying, we shouldn't act like, yeah, Nostradamus about what happened on Monday, and I think that that's the right right. There, there's not um, tea leaves to read out specific future events. I, however, think it's very Catholic to think that there are a multitude of symbols mm. in that event uh, and its aftermath that we can read into and say that God can use even something like a cathedral, probably catching on fire just because of something. Like, you know, a Frenchman left too warm of a baguette up in, you know, the tresses or something. Um, it might be something just like that, but then it makes us stop and think. And so, you know, we, we talked in the first half, half of the hour with uh, Stephen about, you know, true happiness. And I just wanted to say that I think God gives us events like, of course, Holy Week, but yeah. then events during Holy Week for us to say, what really is true happiness? What endures um so, yeah, I, I think that's the opening statement I wanted to make about um, what happened on Monday and, and hopefully assuage some people who think that if they were being scolded a bit about reading something into it, I, it's not like you should be like that dude who threw all his money on Tiger Woods winning the Masters. Um, I'm not saying that there's some future event that it predicted, um, but certainly we worship the sort of God that precisely what he would do is take what could be just a fire with a building and imbue it with meaning for us to say, hopefully you look back, you know, April 2019, Monday of Holy Week, and that what you felt between first finding out about the fire of Notre Dame and then how it ended up, that that could be something that really changes your life. Yeah, Bo, I think you're right to talk, like, to have the the remark about Nostradamus. Like, to me, you have to be careful about how you connect the dots. So I saw some commentary about the incident where people clearly wanted to dunk on, like, secularism. (laughs) And so when this when this tragic event took place, you know, they're like, this is a sign of, like, the burning shards of Western civilization. Um, but that that's different. Like, that sort of thing where you're just waiting to provide a certain kind of commentary, and then, like, an event gives you the, uh, the, uh, the intro into doing that, is different from saying, like, should something like this give us pause? And what was really intriguing to me, Bo, is, you know, the phrase overburdened with meaning? Mm-hmm. I think, like, if you look at secular commentary, I'm talking about, like, journalists in the mainstream media, there's a hunger for meeting, because, like, think, like, in civilization 500 years from now, is there anything that we're creating or involved in today that if it were to be destroyed several centuries down the road, everyone would stop what they were doing? I mean, literally, Bo, I don't think it was because of my Twitter follows. It was really, like, a national conversation, like, this monument is, is, is potentially being destroyed what like what is our culture committed to or contributing to that would have an analogous event down the road right everyone's like oh no starbucks 3752 burned i'll go to the one across the street and i mean i there's a lot of complex things that people bring up that yeah. i think um are tone deaf so you want to talk about accusatory radio this is bud and, us, and me being shock jocks about notre dame here you go what when people go, how can you cry about a building and not about this or that person dying? Well, look, I, I, and I, I'm stealing this one from, I think, Jeremy McClellan. Yeah. Um, that would be like going to someone else's funeral and then asking why no one cried at your mom's funeral. Um, when, when you're, if you're going to start making this a competition about did we, did we mourn the like proper amount, you start to think of mourning as sort of a, 
um, it's like gasoline or firewood or, you know, it's like settlers of Catan, like mortaring starts to be, uh, you know, this sort of thing that you can measure up and pile up and say this got more mourning than something else really seems to miss the point. It also seems to miss the point that the reason I think something that stood for 800 years and has a central role in anybody who considers them Catholic or even nominally or post-Christian is that a lot of people's lives sort of were perpetuated in that cathedral, and especially when it seemed like the whole thing was going to burn down, that really did start to be frightening. Now, I understand people go like, look, we've had three uh, very historic African-American churches burned down, and by arson, and we know by white supremacists who on purpose are meaning to do it. Why isn't that getting enough airplay? And look, I'm with you. When it started out, I was retweeting this and saying we need to be talking about this. Yeah. And someone made the point, right, that the, the horrible white supremacists that are doing this on purpose, they actually realize the importance of buildings, not only because those are nexuses of like physical history, right? That's, that's like history about African Americans that probably don't, doesn't exist anymore because it burned down in those records with the church. Yeah. Um, but it's also a huge web of connected common life that goes away. And so when either it's done on purpose, like the horrible uh, arson fires um, in uh, the South that have happened, um, other French uh, churches have actually been uh, suspected of having arson attacked to them well, not the cathedral. But even if it's accidental, like Notre Dame, when buildings burn down, it's because humanity is symbolic that sometimes it takes a building symbolizing a lot of people for them to then mourn people. Because especially in our day and age where death happens in the peripheries, it's kind of hard for us to imagine what it means to truly mourn. And sometimes a building represents that sadness better than an obituary. Whether that's like true of all humans for all times or just us, I think that that's what people need to uh get into their minds instead of thinking like people love buildings more than people. That's not what's going on. Yeah. Bo, I mean, part of what I hear you saying is that we have to have like the ultimate tell us or purpose in mind. And there is a way, like I saw, I saw individuals commenting on Twitter and they made it solely about preserving Western civilization. Right. But as many Catholics rightly pointed out for us, it's not this kind of like utilitarian, like, Oh, we're preserving a certain culture. But like you're saying, our faith is incarnational, and this is where our children was baptized. This is where worship was given uh, to the true God. Um, our good friend of the show, Tim O'Malley, ha- had a great little commentary about the event, and he wrote, Catholics love churches, but they love the reason for their existence even more. It is Christ who has built up the church into a living body, a temple of gathered stones made for praise. It is Christ who promises new life and new hope. It is Christ who forever transformed Human history has not just built churches, but the whole communion of saints into his living, breathing body. And so these things, um, like you're saying, Bo, like, like Tim is saying, we always have to have our orientation right. And there is a way, even in the Catholic faith, where we, we treasure sacred art and we treasure beautiful churches, where we could turn those things into an idolatrous occasion. But I think when you saw, like, Frenchmen and French women, the citizenry of Paris, singing Ave Maria's before the burnt building, it gave you a really powerful image that this was ultimately um, about the faith. Well, I think, you know, the, the, okay, what events like this do is they usually show two sides of a coin, right? On one hand, we can look at it and go, oh, my goodness, look how bad things have gotten. And then you flip the coin and you go, but look at the remarkable, you know, beams of hope that shine through in places that are unsuspecting. So to deal with the negative first, um, this event shows how, at least in some parts, of especially modern academia, unfortunately, because academics seem to take to Twitter like, I mean, they're moths to a flame. Um, and when you hear people say, like, oh, I don't care about Notre Dame burning down, it's a, I, I mean, I think they said a citadel of colonialism. And you're like, yeah. uh, literally, this was built before any ships sailed west on the Atlantic, right? So, like, on one hand, because someone's like, I wonder how many colonial works of art have been stolen and put in Notre Dame. And you're like, well, absolutely none, actually, <laughs> because uh, they weren't there. Um, or you hear people, they'll say, like, why, why do people care about, you know, this place in France uh, that they have no connection to? And you go, hold up, Joan of Arc is there. And anybody who has Joan of Arc as a patron saint or, like, our yeah. show views her as someone central to what they do, 
um, automatically, like, she's there, right? Like, Our Lady, and we all have a connection to Our Lady, hopefully, so that's her cathedral. And you start realizing that people find the idea that there is a spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood through the saints incomprehensible. So for them, it can be like, well, you only like it because it's French. And uh, instead of saying, well, no, I mean, well, first of all, right, some of us have family that probably goes back to France. But even besides that, even if I didn't, yeah. Joan of Arc, that's like she's there, Our Lady. It's it's much bigger than that. But on the flip side, to make it not all negative, look, uh, Emmanuel Macron, and I'm going to mess up his name, Macron, uh, yeah. in no way is a friend of what I would say a total Catholic view of the world. Yeah. But when he was there with the Archbishop talking about being legitimately I mean, devastated by what he saw and like almost defiantly saying, we're going to figure out how to rebuild this in five years. You could tell that he meant it. And that even if there are people who didn't know why they knew it was important and that for some, it's going to make them double down on the incomprehensibility of the faith to their worldview. But for plenty, bud, you can already start to tell that this event, they go, why do I care so much about this? And that it's leading them to something much deeper. That God can take the fire of Notre Dame and even make vaunted secularists like most of French Republic is start to ask themselves, why do we have such a filial, a motherly connection to this church? And I, I think we're all going to be sit back in amaze that we're going to be amazed at some of the stupidity of the mm. takes going on. But I think we're going to be amazed at what God can do with a burning 800-year-old building. We'll be amazed. Well, at the risk of, of wading into some potentially controversial waters, but what did you think of, and I know some of, um, some of our friends were talking about this on social media as well, what do you think about this idea where I actually heard Catholics say, if the French government or whoever's in charge of the rebuilding wants to turn it into something different, like to make it, to, to incorporate ideas about what French culture represents now, I say just don't even rebuild it. Um, yeah, I mean, how, how are you thinking about the restoration and what's, what might happen there? Well, I mean, part of it is my time-worn example that I think the best, the, the, the world that we legitimately should uh, search for is like the Robin Hood version of the world. So if like uh, French secularists who actually would just spend their money on horrible things otherwise, if we want to bleed their pockets to redo Notre Dame Cathedral, to yeah. me... That's the gospel, buddy, right? Like, if we can trick these people instead of buying their sixth and seventh jet ski into yeah. making Notre Dame have a roof again, let's do it, right? Let's convince them that there's other things that need to be rebuilt. And on that re regard, right, like, to me, this is sort of the brilliance of Christendom is not that it's this uh, sort of encased in amber lords and ladies, like, praying their, you know, prayer books and then being perfect. No, you read Chaucer, you read anyone uh, the Middle Ages is full of scoundrels and people who only half or quarter care about the faith. But what was great about Christendom is those people felt social pressure that if they were going to make a lot of money and spend it on something, man, they built cathedrals and they built monasteries. Yeah. I'm all for that. The legitimate worry that I think some people have is if it burned down all the way and they had to totally rebuild it, they had little faith that anything like what it used to be would be built up, right? And then it would be, I think, as our friend Brandon McGinley said, something like, like a, a Disneyfication of it. And yeah, that would be, that would be, it seems to me, to no purpose. But God had better plans. The medieval architects had better plans. Most of it stands. I don't think you can Disneyfy too much. Maybe yeah. you can make a roof that looks kind of silly. <laughs> but I think mostly. Um, yeah, if we want to take French secularist money to rebuild Notre Dame Cathedral, power to us. That sounds exactly like something that our Lord would do. Well, uh, I, I saw a news story today about like um, an architectural competition, like designs for the spire, which makes me a little bit nervous. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wait and see before I get too dogmatic about anything. You know, uh, Ross Duthout, who writes for the New York Times, is one of the few like conservative voices at that newspaper – he said in some ways, like, these events should, should call all of us who are, who are involved in the Catholic, like he calls it civil wars, this kind of like sniping back and forth from the left and right, mm -hmm. that um, it should give us pause. And uh, I think doubt that was using, I mean, I think he was commenting on the event in a helpful way. And what I mean by that 
is I'm not calling for like a false peace or like a truce when there's serious disagreement. But I think what he was saying in part, Bo, is like, look at what this culture, totally infused with like love of God and the Catholic faith, what what they were able to achieve, and you know, like just this what the kind of heritage they passed on to us. And I worry sometimes, like maybe in today's Catholic world, if we get bogged down with the idea of like our side winning, when really there are elements of the faith, like there there are times we have to argue about moral theology, mm-hmm. but in what ways, like, are we just saying like we want our liturgies and our architecture and things to look this way because you know it's about giving glory to God and we want to give the best that we can. Well, to use the time-honored Catholic slogan, it's time for a little both hand, bud. <laughs> there we go. And what I mean by this is. You know, uh, on one hand, you have articles that say what we need to learn from this lesson is to not grip onto anything too closely, right? It's like Simca Fisher. There's other people who wrote this. That yep. what, what this reminds us of is that all things pass. And you go, that's absolutely something, right? Even Notre Dame Cathedral will burn down. And at the end of time, all of these great works will build it, but burn down, right? Because yep. they are a type and not the fulfillment, right? They point to something higher. But at the same time... What starts to be amazing, right, is that Notre Dame Cathedral didn't burn to the ground. And the great people who built uh, Notre Dame Cathedral the way they did knew there would be fires, right? They weren't silly optimists. They knew there would be fires. They re- wrote protocols to what you do when, when the roof burns down. Uh, the French firefighters carried out 200-year-old protocols about what do you do in the case of Notre Dame burning to the ground. Wow. And they even, this is what's crazy, after the French Revolution, they planted trees by the Versailles Palace that they go, in the event of Notre Dame Cathedral burning down, we'll use these trees for wood for the next uh, roof. And they're, cl- they're, I mean, you can go look at the picture. So on one hand, don't grasp onto things too tightly. But on the other hand, right, isn't it miraculous that the, the, the people who built this realize that with the faith, even in organic stone, becomes like a living thing, and we now have a symbiotic relationship with these cathedrals. Like, we, we tend them like a garden, and they tend our souls as, you know, the, the, the generations keep passing on. Mm-hmm. There's literally a life cycle to cathedrals, and the former way, the former civilization understood that, and that's a lesson that we can learn. So we need to learn not to hold on to things too tightly, but we also need to realize that there's depths of lessons we have yet to learn from the people who have made, sustained, and are continuing to do so with the Cathedral yeah. of Notre Dame. And that, though, that, you know, speaking of the happiness, the happiness that can surpass the fleeting time of our lifetime and how an entire community can be happy, sort of seen in that life cycle of a cathedral. Well, I hope this doesn't sound too trite, Bo, but I think even about the particular vocations that God gives us, you know, hopefully... Like just thinking about Notre Dame and its its long life and everything this week, um, like for those of us who who do work with our hands, like whether it's carpentry or gardening or whatever, um, I, I think bringing the same care uh, to, to whatever task we have in life, like there's something really beautiful about that. Where you know our first impulse isn't necessarily to go to IKEA, right? But to you know to give that kind of care and attention. To things they may they may not last as long as Notre Dame. I mean that's hard to pull off. But even like a a, a chair, like a rocking chair done well, I think that's a way of of witnessing to the faith. Yeah, I'm actually now terrified of the idea of an, an IKEA built uh, cathedral. That's right. Like they just, probably thought about it. Just yeah. even the instructions filled me with terror. Well, um, but that we're reaching the end of our show. Uh, so may Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, in our families our city, our state, in a special way um, to Paris and uh, all those involved with Our Lady uh, at Notre Dame Cathedral, Uh, the entire world, solar system, galaxy, even even that black hole. May Jesus Christ, uh, the Prince of Peace, give grace and blessing and peace to all of it. This is The Uncommon Good, and we'll be back next week after this Easter season. So go to Mass. God bless you the rest of this uh, Holy Week. But there's all sorts of things we do on Iowa Catholic Radio, but I think we really want to say, please go look online, um, all of the area ways, wherever you are, Oklahoma, Kansas, Pittsburgh, and uh, figure out how to make as much of the Holy Triduum as possible. So I make that pitch 
Um, but then also after uh, that's all done, when Easter season is truly in swing, we have stuff coming up for you. The Iowa Catholic Radio Golf Outing is June 14th at eight, an 8 a.m. shotgun start um, at Blank Golf Course, County Light Road. And uh, John Leonetti and Iowa Catholic Radio, they're joining Blessman International uh, for a pilgrimage to South Africa August 1st through August 13th. I don't think anyone on earth should miss the opportunity to go on a foreign trip with John Leonetti. So all of that you can go look into iocatholicradio.com. Please check that out. But if people want to stay tuned through the radio waves, what are ways they can do that? Yeah, this time of year where everyone's thinking about deepening their prayer life, if you want to take some baby steps, maybe just think about um, praying the rosary with us on air. Uh, it's, it's prayed daily at 5.30 a.m., 9.30 a.m. and 9.30 p.m. And we also have the Angelus at 6 a.m. And then uh, just to keep in mind, uh, this is a ministry that's not just the people talking here, uh, but you guys are intimately a part of that as well. I know there's many things that we're asking for uh, in the world today for your contributions, like we said, the cathedral in Notre Dame, uh, ADAs, uh, specific appeals for people, people you know. Um, so we understand that there's a, a lot of need in this world, but if it can, you, we can keep it tucked in the back of your mind, um, if you can think about it. Um, Iowa Catholic Radio is supported by listeners like you and your donations, and you are an intimate part of this ministry, and we want to thank you for all you've done. This is The Uncommon Good for Bud Marr. I'm Bo Bonner. We'll be back next week. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard every week on wonderful Catholic stations like this one and anytime on podcast. Just search for The Uncommon Good.